All right. So from that, we want to get into our discussion tonight. Like we promised you, we have with us Winnie Bianima. She's the executive director of Oxfam International. Thank you so much uh, for coming to our studios. And indeed, Karibu Kenya, you've been busy That's while right here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> you've been meeting women leaders, and we'll get to that in a moment. But um, first, let's start off with... Uh, what we are grappling with in the country at the moment. It's what we're calling the Mamamboga Bill, which is an aim at making sure that those that sell vegetables are in designated areas, but it's also an attempt at bringing them into the tax bracket. Many people say this will be... Um, you know, a blow to women's empowerment because many of those that are selling vegetables by the roadside, the small holders, the small farm holders are women. What are your thoughts on this? There's a point in that, and we have to look at it more broadly. It's coming from somewhere. There is pressure coming to the African leaders and African governments to raise taxes, more taxes, to fund their own development. It's important that African countries fund their own development and increase the tax revenues they collect. But what developed countries are saying is not fair to the extent that they are pushing harder and harder on, de on developing countries to tax even the poorest and to collect resources from those without resources while not addressing some key issues such as the huge resources that Africa loses from tax loopholes. And these tax loopholes are legal. Some are illegal. It's tax evasion mm -hmm. by companies cheating, beating our tax systems, but there is also a lot of tax avoidance that's legal, that's supported by developed countries and their multinationals, and we've calculated that Africa alone lost 11 billion tax revenue in 2010. Now, if that could be collected, you wouldn't need to harass market women. Uh -huh. Okay, all and right. That's money Absolutely. Let's talk about the two-thirds gender rule. Um, we're having, you know, an issue with that now and having a third of women in elective office. We can't seem to agree on the right formula, so much so that there's a bill in Parliament to sort of make this progressive. Women are saying this is indefinite postponement. What is your observation of this case in Kenya? You know, Kenyan women have been struggling for their political voice for a long time. We respect their struggles. They've been fighting and fighting to be part of democracy. Democracy is not democracy without half the population in it. Now, this is the last lap. It's there in the Constitution. It needs to be implemented. What I found out this week is that there are many formulas on the table, and that's not helpful. Women need to come behind one formula, sell it, take it to the population, get all the women and fair men, fair-minded men, to support it and push it hard through parliament. Have one formula. And our experience in, Af in the East African countries is that you need to build on the electoral system that exists and not try to change an existing electoral system because that already is set and is very hard to change. So we have a first past the post electoral system. The, the quota should be built around that. And secondly, it's important that women are elected, that That's they right. are not just nominated. nominated. Mm -hmm. So as a, a formula that guarantees that women are elected by the population so that they are accountable to voters is also important. But thirdly, it's also important that women do not seek a formula that is displacing men. That's a lesson we learned in Uganda and Tanzania. That when you seek a formula that is asking men to give up seats that they have held, they have a sense of entitlement, which is wrong, but it is there. Then you set, up, you set yourself up for a a really terrible fight with men seeing themselves as losers. So the quota in Uganda and Tanzania are additional seats. And there are advantages in that 
and we have oh, made here those we have, advantages. We have a ballooning wage bill, so selling the idea of additional seats becomes a bit of a hard sell in Kenya. Well, that's, that's false economics, totally false economics. First of all, the Kenyan parliament is the highest paid parliament in the world. They need to do something to restore their credibility and put their wages down, take their monuments down because inequality is bad, it's immoral, it's uneconomic. So there are many ways to raise resources and this extra pay for a couple of more seats uh, will, not, will not bankrupt the Kenyan government. Look, you have these seats in Rwanda, you have them in Uganda, you have them in Tanzania, and all those three countries are poorer than Kenya. Mm. So the question of cost is, re of cost is a false economy. All right. Let's talk about um, women being ready to lead. And it's a two-pronged question. Do you think that they're ready to do that? And also, do you think they're taking this message out to the women so that they can get grassroots support? A poll a survey was done about three weeks ago, and it was asking whether, it was just asking the basic question if people out there knew the constitutional requirement requiring at least one third uh, of those uh, in parliament to be women. And it would surprise you to know that 33% of women got the correct answer. 24% got it wrong and 43% didn't even know. Mm -hmm. So these women who are on the ground for whom this requirement will benefit aren't even aware of it. Um, do you think women leaders in Kenya have done enough in terms of mobilizing the grassroots to get this requirement met? You raise an important point. Indeed, all women in the country should know about the importance of this provision and what it means for them and their voice. Because we don't push this voice for women in the parliament just for a voice in parliament. It is also symbolic. It is supposed to be a strong signal for a woman who will not aspire to be in parliament, and that's the majority, but wherever she is, to know that I have a voice, I have a right to a voice. I can speak and make decisions in my home. I should be able to speak and make decisions in my community, in my local government. So it's so important that this provision doesn't become the battleground just for women elites who will get into parliament, but that it is a debate that's engaging every woman in her household. All right, let's, uh, I want us to sh shift gears a little bit mm. from the issue of women and talk about Millennium Development Goals for just a moment. Uh, that meeting that's coming up in September this year, world leaders at the UN General Assembly will be taking stock of the last 15 years and making plans for the next. Mm. Many people have said that the SDGs are far too ambitious. We want, what, 15 goals and 54 targets? And the issue also about funding these development goals. What are your thoughts on how far we have come mm. and how we're going to get the money to actually fund this so it's not about donor aid anymore. You raise very important questions. The, the world governments have agreed to 17 goals. They are okay. They are achievable, but indeed they are ambitious. And the question of financing them is critical. Another meeting is going to happen in July here in Addis Ababa, and that will be about financing those sustainable development goals. And what we are seeing is that, again, first the donors who usually give a portion of financing as aid are not putting, are not being ambitious about living up to their commitment of aid. But disturbingly too, we see that developing countries are net contributors to rich countries through the money they lose through tax avoidance and tax evasion. Yesterday, the IMF re released a report that showed that the total resources that are lost to developing countries is more than the total aid, That's 139 coming in. billion coming into the developing countries. I mean, if only we could get an agreement, and that's what Oxfam wants at the meeting of the financing for development in Addis Ababa, an agreement to have an international tax body that is setting the rules for global corporate tax so that we close all those loopholes that companies use, the tricks they use to cheat us of our revenues. That could fund our development. That would stop us begging.
for aid. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about uh, civil society and uh, civil liberties across the region. Mm -hmm. uh, many say, particularly in Kenya, the spaces are shrinking. Civil society was once quite robust. Um, with the election of 2003 and we had the new government with Mwai Kibaki, many civil society activists actually made their way into either government or in parliament. And some say civil society is dead right now or that it has no place. We have a fully functioning democracy, we have a Bill of Rights, freedom of media, freedom of association. We have a new constitution uh, that came out five years ago. Some say civil society isn't needed anymore. Uh, what would you say? First, it's important to make the correction that civil society is not synonymous with NGOs. NGOs are part of civil society. Civil society includes churches, trade unions, professional bodies and all kinds of associations that make up a vibrant democracy. I think Kenya can be proud of having a vibrant democracy here on this continent. I mean, you have a press that's fairly free. You have political parties that contest elections and, uh, and share power through elections. You are a fairly democratic country, but it is true that in, across Africa, we are seeing new laws coming in, particularly laws that are supposed to tighten security in order to deal with the threat of terrorism and laws that are intended to uh, promote sustainable development and these are often targeting non-governmental organizations. Non-governmental organizations are seen as either anti-development because they are shouting about environmental damage, shouting about the rights of poor people being pushed off land. And they also think, many governments who are undemocratic think that we are the ones encouraging young people to rise against uh, dictatorships. But to tell you the truth, Africa's youth are going to be our blessing or they are going to be a, democratic, a demographic bomb because our young people are so many. We are the youngest continent. In 25 years, will be more people on this continent than Chinese. And these young people, if they don't get jobs, if they remain locked out of democratic processes, will, will, will explode on us. And it won't be NGOs to blame. Right. L Let's talk about a vibrant democracy yeah. uh, such as this one. Even on social media, people are pretty free to speak their minds yes. on various issues. Mm. What's the role of civil society in, in a case like that? Civil society here was for pushing for freedom of speech, freedom mm. of association, freedom of media. Mm. That seems to have happened. What do you think should be the way civil society can now uh, re-engineer and remodel itself to be relevant to modern day challenges? Okay, earlier on, when there were struggles for democracy, for multi-party democracy, for a new constitution, NGOs were seen to be in the vanguard of that struggle for democratic democratization. Now you say the democracy is achieved. But norm in, in, in a thriving democracy then, organizations of civil society cha organize and channel the interests of groups in society through the decision-making process. So you get organizations that work on environment. They will be there lobbying politicians, lobbying co corporates on environmental issues. Organizations like ours who will fight poverty. We will always have a role to organize, empower people to demand their rights against poverty, to benefit economically, to be part of growth. So more and more organizations of civil society will be there to champion particular interests of people to organize, for people to organize and get what they deserve from their governments, okay. from their companies. Let's talk about civil liberties uh, across the continent, uh, the events in Burundi and we also here in Rwanda, mm -hmm. they're now debating that bill that would essentially allow uh, President Kagame to have uh, to run for yet another term um, and also what's happening within your own home country in mm -hmm. Uganda. Mm -hmm. uh, 
what are your thoughts on what's happening in Burundi right now, gearing up for an election, the situation as it is, um, the people trying to um, contest or even speak out against President mm -hmm. Nkurunzinza, and, and we know of what's happened with the opposition leader there being killed. Again, a very important question. From fighting for women's right to be part of democracies, then you have to ask yourself what is happening in the area of democratic development in our region. It's not very positive, I must say. What we saw in Burundi were young people coming out on the streets, they've been on the streets for two, three weeks now, insisting that the Arusha agreements be upheld. Those agreements are so important for securing peace and putting Burundi on a democratic path. I can't understand why an individual should insist so much on his legal right to contest an election, even if it means that people should be shot and killed. Why are you so important? What's that ego about? I mean, if you think about it in your home, how many times do you give up your right simply in order to have peace in the house? You don't insist, it's my right to speak and I'm going to insist because I'm the mother. You just say, okay, have your way. This is what I think, that in Burundi, it's not even a legal issue of whether or not this incumbent can run. It should be a question of judgment, political judgment, that in the interest of this country, if there's this group of people who are seeing that I should not contest, then stand aside. Let others contest. That's how I would see it. And I'm seeing the repression of people, the force that has been used to suppress uh, the protesters as very negative for our region. And I really would like to discourage the regional leaders who are going to be meeting this weekend from encouraging the incumbent to hold on, to encourage that the agreements are, with, are, are upheld. And, and look at the, the you, you ask about my country, I can tell you that in my country, we have a typical illiberal democracy where you have organized elections every five years, but where the press is not free, parties are suppressed, human rights are suppressed, and there's no freedom of association or assembly or speech. How can that be a democracy? So you need, we need to develop our democracies further. Regular elections don't define what democracy is. In fact, they are managed elections in many countries. You can get a situation like Egypt, where Mubarak was overthrown a few months after he got 97% of the vote. What does that mean? Mm. Let's talk, you've mentioned uh, your home country, Uganda, uh, yeah. talking about democratization. Um, you left active politics some years back to get into um, the diplomatic corps and the work that you're doing now. Are you willing to go back home to Uganda and to be in the fight against democracy? Would you, Winnie Bianima, consider running for elective office, running for the presidency in Uganda? I am asked many times that question, and I could. I am ready. I could run. But today, I have a good job fighting poverty around the world, lifting those people who many of these governments won't even give a voice, won't even give a chance, an opportunity to be part of growth. I give them a chance. I fight on their behalf. And I'm happy to serve Oxfam in that role. But I can tell you, I care about my country. I watch the events in that country. And yes, I keep listening to this voice. And at some point, I may rise to the challenge. So you would one day after Oxfam, after it's all done? I can. I could. All right, absolutely. Let's wind up with your thoughts on where Africa needs to go. I know you're talking a lot about taxes and, mm. you know, just shoring up our own revenues from within. Um, what, in your view, because we also have Agenda 2063, mm. which is talking about Africa's development agenda over the next 50 years, what, in your view, would get us to that point, would get us to, once we're discussing the SDGs, for the next 15 years, 
What is it, that one thing you think that will turn this continent around? The problem with our leaders is that they are often not serious. They want to engage in big dreams and big plans and, and they fail to make you know, step-by-step -step plans to take their countries forward. The Sustainable Development Goals are a plan for the next 20 years. Pushing on those is, is very important and that's why I'm focused very much on how to raise the resources and also put in place the strategies that will use those resources to promote a growth, but a growth that is providing the millions of jobs that our young people need. So first we must raise our resources. That means we must tax, we must stop giving these tax uh, exemptions to all these companies, stop this unhealthy competition of trying to give more and more tax breaks in order to attract business, but collaborate and extract fair taxes from companies that make money here, but use that money, reinvest it in those sectors that create the millions of jobs that our young people need. So this, the work is cut out for our leaders, and it's not rocket science. Those who are doing it are growing and creating employment and lifting people out of poverty, like China. I mean, Chinese were not made in, on Mars. Mm. They are human beings like us. We can do it too. We can do it. So it's about collecting our revenues and putting them behind strategies that promote jobs, jobs, growth that comes with a lot of jobs and incomes mm. for our young people. Thank you very much for that. We wish you the best and uh, we hope you will come back to KTN again once you're around and uh, we look forward to what will be happening in July in Addis and of course later on in September with uh, the UN General Assembly. Thank you very much for your time You're a today. great host. Thank, thank you very you. much. Oh, Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here. I've been speaking to Winnie Bianima. She's the Oxfam International Executive Director talking about Africa and where we need to go in the next 15, 20, 30, 40 years, shoring up our own revenues to finance well-placed strategies for development on the continent. John Alanamo has been following our conversation and sums it up. He has What's the Point tonight.